So with us tonight is John McCarthy. Um, the board knows uh, John very well. He's done a lot of strategic planning work with the board and has done goal setting retreats and um, worked a great deal with the board uh, the summer after of uh, Indian Point's announced closure. And uh, he and his uh, former colleague, Lynn Allen at Putnam uh, Northern Westchester BOCES and previous superintendent, uh, Jim Langlois worked with the board and, and helped us really focus and prioritize what life after Indian Point looked like. We did a, we did a book study uh, and from that book study, we built uh, a multi-year plan of how to get ready uh, for life after Indian Point. And a significant piece of that was uh, commissioning a school facility study, um, a cost analysis that was done uh, back in 2018. That report was given to the board back in November of 2019. And there were a number of options for the board to consider uh, in terms of reorganizing students or potentially closing schools that could bring the district significant savings to offset drastic tax increases. Um, in January of 2020, the board narrowed, uh, narrowed down the options um, to the Princeton plan, which are uh, dividing elementary students by grade level and have them move between the three elementary schools by grade level or status quo, basically the uh, model that we currently have uh, and um, uh, not abandon that and, and keep it the way it is. So um, over the last number of months, we identified actually it was a year ago, uh, we had a stakeholder committee, about 30 plus uh, members, which um, John will, will thank them and identify them shortly. Um, but our first meeting was supposed to be in person on March 27th, 2020. Uh, and uh, as all of you know, our world changed then. So our focus uh, went to online instruction and trying to wrap up last year. And then our focus all summer was reopening this year and making sure we had all the systems and structures in place. Um, and at the board's request, we revisited the uh, conversation with the stakeholder group around the Princeton plan. Uh, the stakeholder committee did meet back in late November. We identified some school districts in our area to speak to, to learn more about their experience and help answer our questions. Uh, and we moved along the process of uh, tonight's presentation, which is presenting the Board of Education in the community a SWOT analysis. And I'll turn it over to John to talk about the SWOT analysis, the process, and his involvement uh, facilitating this group for us, um, which was supposed to start last, uh, uh, last March, but started in earnest in November. So John, take it away. Thanks, Joe. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to be back at Hendrick Hudson and working with you again. Um, uh, Greg, if you can go to the, to the next slide, please. Now, for me, this is the most important slide, right? We have a, a, a wonderful group here that has met, and all of us owe this group a big thank you for all the work that they have done for us. As Joe mentioned before, it's a rather large group. There's actually 37 uh, people who are involved in this group. Um, they're comprised of parents, community members, teachers, and administrators. And their ability to work and function as a team um, really needs to be recognized and thanked. Um, again, hopefully some of them are on the, watching this live tonight, um, but really what a wonderful group to work with. And also um, you can see the double asterisk down below for Greg. Um, as you guys know, Greg is just an unbelievably uh, great professional. Um, he has been instrumental in helping us. Obviously this online format, um, doing things virtually is not ideal for this kind of work. But uh, with Greg's help, we've been able to really do some amazing things to um, get to the answers that we were looking for. I don't know if the board would like to say something to this group, but uh, again, for me, um, this is the most important slide. Uh, this is really a tremendous group and uh, really, uh, I can't say enough about them. Yeah, I'd just like to thank everybody for their involvement in this group. It was a tremendous time commitment. And I think feel like everybody that agreed to work with the stakeholder committee, really put their heart and soul into it. They really were very thoughtful, um, tried to get as much information as possible, gather information from the community that the community might want to hear as well. So I am really proud of them and I'm very happy that they were able to participate in this process and I hope that it was um, educational and useful for them as well. So thank you again for that commitment. Does anybody else wanna make any comments? 
Well, perhaps we can wait to the end. I don't see anyone making any additional comments, but um, we can wait to the end because I think uh, when you see the final product and the, the work that they were able to accomplish, I think it'll be very impressive for the board. Next slide, please. Joe, do you wanna just continue with this slide a little bit? Cause you've mentioned some of the things on here. If not, I can go through it if you'd like. Yeah, sorry, I had my, uh, I had my, my microphone off. So this is, um, as, as John said, I'll just, oh, here we go, um, our, our timeline. Um, so we uh, first met in November uh, on Zoom, which is, as John said, wasn't ideal, but necessary to uh, identify uh, what our goals were and what the charge of the committee was. Um, the committee had many, many questions, right? This was a very intro level of learning what the Princeton plan is and um, trying to identify more information and where we could go. Uh, what we did was we identified three school districts uh, in our region, our immediate region, that uh, are organized in the Princeton plan. And you see them here, Austin, Somers, and Terrytown, um, districts of similar demographics and districts of different demographics. And uh, we identified the top 10 questions that the committee had, and we scheduled, I believe it was seven meetings with various uh, stakeholders from Ossining, Somers, and Terrytown. Uh, teachers, administrators, parents, uh, PTA members. And basically, uh, John and I just played matchmaker. We uh, identified uh, dates and times everyone was available. We set up a Zoom or a Google Meet and uh, each of those seven meetings went through the standard 10 questions to make sure everyone was hearing the same information. And then there was a, a great opportunity for Q&A, conversations about how PTAs are involved or um, uh, different transition experiences that school districts use because kids are you know, moving between first and second grade. How does special ed uh, services or programs um, move or support children? Uh, what happens when a transition doesn't go so well? Uh, all of those things. And uh, it, it really was enlightening because um, there were so many uh, questions and, and interests and some concerns um, that it was great to have folks who, who live it, who experience it, who work in it, or parents you know, who, who have children uh, supporting those models. You know, what do you do if you have a kid in two schools? How do the sc elementary schools communicate to make sure they don't have concerts on the same night or back to school night, those sort of things. Um, those meetings generated a few more questions uh, on the operations end. Uh, so we scheduled a, another round of uh, meetings for the committee uh, to, to learn a little bit more about the financial side of the Princeton plan. We've said that the Princeton plan can bring the district significant savings. And we talked about how we talked about what class sizes would look like, um, number of teachers by grade level in each of the three schools, um, the fact that no programs would be eliminated, but the savings come from being more efficient and having more kids in the same place at the same time that need the same program. Uh, and that's, that's uh, important that uh, in this model, there are no programs um, that would be eliminated. Um, we then had additional uh, Q&A opportunities just as um, members of the stakeholder committee were learning more or going back to their PTAs and uh, talking to their families and getting more questions. Uh, and then we had five small SWOT analysis meetings last week. Uh, so as John said earlier, we had a, a committee of, of close to 40 folks, and we wanted to make sure that we had um, meetings to facilitate high levels of input and participation from every single member. And we knew that uh, one way to do that was to have smaller group settings. So what John did is he facilitated five different meetings. One, one day last week, everyone picked, uh, picked a meeting and signed up for it. Uh, so the culmination uh, that you'll see later today is a result of five, um, five groups of folks that went through, um, uh, had this experience, and then all came together this Monday night for a little over three hours and compiled all of their feedback and input to the report that you're going to hear tonight. So the committee's work uh, was not simple. It was very daunting. It was very uh, intense. Um, Everyone spent a considerable amount of their own time and, and energy learning more and asking questions and being involved. So we're really, really proud of um, uh, the fact that they took their role seriously. And we think that they provided the board and community 
um, some really tangible feedback in terms of uh, what potential next steps could be. And just to piggyback a little bit on that, it's really important when you go into the SWOT analysis that you have a really good understanding of the issues facing the district. And I will tell you that I, I believe our group does. And even more importantly, to really understand the Princeton plan model. So I think with a series of the, these meetings that you see in front of you and conversations that happened over the last couple of months, I really believe that our group had a real good understanding of the Princeton model and also the issues facing the district. Next slide, please. So this is the charge that we were given. Um, the, the charge was basically to perform the SWOT analysis. As Joe said, it was a series of meetings that led up to this um, and then provide the board with feedback from the SWOT analysis. And again, I think this group took it very seriously and I'm hoping at the end of this evening, you'll think that you'll believe that the information they have provided you will be very helpful as you make your decisions moving forward. Next slide. So um, in order to do a SWOT analysis properly, you have to have a goal, something that you're working towards, right? And as an agency, you wanna look at, you know, what are some of the things that are currently going on in your district and what are some of the things out there that are gonna help you either obtain your goal or maybe pretend, uh, prevent you from getting to your goal. Now we had to work about what was possible, not what was impossible. So for us, we had to believe that the district was moving in this direction um, as far as going to the Princeton plan. But to be very clear, um, and, and it was said to the group, and I wanna make sure it's on this presentation as well. This does not mean that the board has made a decision moving in the direction of the Princeton plan, but for us, we needed to think that way so we could really look at this really deep and really make sure that um, at the end of the day, if you do choose to move in this direction, you'll have the information that you'll need to help you be successful. Make sense? All right, next slide, please. So um, let me briefly explain, explain to you the SWOT analysis process. Um, as the board knows, and Joe mentioned before, this is a process that the board used a number of years ago as they were facing the closing of Indian Point. So SWOT stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. And I'm gonna just go through this uh, matrix with you a little bit. So you have an understanding of, of each of the different boxes and how they interact, uh, interact. So let's just talk about the strengths and the weaknesses, the top part, right? That is things that are going on in the present, right? So what are our current strengths for the district? And what are some of our current weaknesses in the district, right? And I think um, it's important that you understand though, as we looked at our strengths and weaknesses, we were looking at it through the lens of if we were to move to the Princeton plan, right? Not currently everything going on in our district, all the strengths, all the weaknesses, but we're really trying to identify those strengths and those potential weaknesses that would help us or hurt us as we move forward in looking at going towards the Princeton plan. The bottom two, opportunities and threats, are futuristic and outside threats, outside of the organization, things that are going on. So what are the opportunities potentially out there if we were to move to the Princeton plan? And then what are some of the potential threats that are out there that could stop us or pro prohibit us from moving towards the uh, Princeton plan? So now I wanna look at it this way, right? I wanna look at strengths and opportunities. The things that are identified there are things that will help us obtain our goal, right? So the strengths that we currently have, we wanna maximize those. We wanna take advantage of any opportunities that are out there that can make our plan successful. The things on the right-hand side, the weaknesses and the threats are things that are potentially harmful. They're gonna stop us from getting to our goals. So what are the current weaknesses that we have right now in place that we need to either fix or eliminate, right, totally? And what are some of the threats that are out there that could potentially hurt us? And we need to ward those off. So as we did this exercise, we we're looking at it through the lens of if we were to move to this plan, what are our strengths of the district that we want to maximize, right? What are some of our weaknesses that we want to take away? What are some of the opportunities that we want to take advantage of? And what are some of the threats that are out there that we want to ward off? Any questions from the board about this slide? Okay, next slide, please. So as Joe said, on Monday night, um, we met. And uh, what I'd like you to just make sure you have in front of you tonight is this large list. Now this list the board has um, is the backup material that we utilized on the night of uh, March 8th when we did our prioritize, prioritizing of the uh, SWOT analysis. Um, there's 202 things on that list, 202 entries. Um, they are either individual thoughts or a couple of people sharing the same thoughts. So our job was to not only go over this list with everybody because they saw it in its entirety for the first time on, on Monday night, but then what we had to do was try and prioritize the strengths, 
the weaknesses, the opportunities and threats. Try and narrow them down to give the board a helpful tool to utilize. Now, with that said, you have all the information from, from all the group meetings uh, last week, right? You have every one of the people's thoughts and you can utilize that any way you want. You can utilize it if we were to move forward um, with the Princeton plan or potentially not move forward with the Princeton plan. There's really good information throughout that entire document. So then what we did was the first time we broke out, we asked them to just look at our strengths and our weaknesses. They met as a group. Um, there was six to seven people in each of the groups and they, as their small group, had to narrow it down to um, five different uh, areas and under each of the strengths and the weaknesses. Then we came back as a large group. Um, we tallied out the results, and I'll show you that in a second. And then we had a discussion about narrowing down the priorities. And that, that was really an interesting and a, and a good part of this conversation. Again, not the best way to do it over the, the uh, Zoom kind of meetings, but it, it did, definitely was helpful as far as hearing people and allowing people to be heard. Next slide, please. So in front of you um, was the report out. This is the actual document that came back with the strengths and the weaknesses from each of the groups. Um, I just wanna give again, kudos to um, Greg because he not only did he develop this sheet, um, but he also took the tallies as the meeting was going on, which was really helpful for us as we were um, trying to facilitate the meeting and have a discussion. So as you can see on the left-hand side, each of the groups reported out their top five um, areas and it, it's ranked from their highest to their lowest. And as you can see here, the easy one that stands out to me on the strengths is the number two, right? So that number two, you're gonna see again as we move on to the next slides, but you can see five out of the six groups chose number two as one of the areas that they would like to share with the board. And then group six didn't have the number two, but it did rise to the top because as you can see, many of the groups thought it was an important piece to share with the board. And then the same thing on the right-hand side, we looked at the ones that we had in common, the ones that we had five, um, five groups select, four groups select, and we narrowed it down. The challenge was again, when we got down to the twos and the threes, and then the groups worked it out. One of the things that we decided to do, it kind of was on the spot, was we allowed people to combine some of the numbers. So what you don't see on here, and I'm just gonna use group one as an example, they may have put down 36, you know, the number 36 to their strengths from the large list, but they may have said, you know, but we also thought that 42, uh, 40, 12, and five were somewhat connected to those, and we kind of um, put them together in a grouping. And again, you'll see that in a second. Any questions about how we arrived at this num these numbers here? No? Okay, great. So let's move on to the next slide. So what my goal would be for tonight is to go through each of these slides. And again, it's a lot of information. Um, and I understand that, um, you know, you, you, you're going to have to absorb a lot of this and then potentially use this later on. But I'm going to do my best to explain each of these different um, slides. We'll go through them one at a time. And of course, uh, Joe, Margaret, and Lisa, if you feel comfortable, you can jump in if, if we don't, um, if I don't explain it correctly, or if you have a different thoughts on this. So again, we're looking at this from the highest to the lowest. And there's a couple of slides here that are just gonna talk about the strengths that were identified by our stakeholder committee. So I'll give you a moment to read it. So as you can see in this slide, um, a couple of really great things that, that the district should be proud of. And, and uh, it really is a wonderful thing to hear. The teachers are collaborative. They're highly invested in their children's education. And if you look at the slide, the, the, the next one, which you can see is a combination of three, four, and seven on your large list, there's many things that the district are doing well. They're providing a high quality experience for all students. Um, the special education programs are strong, and there's definitely in place some strong support services to help the students. So again, these are the identified strengths that we can carry forward if we were to use, uh, move towards the Princeton plan. Any questions or comments about these two areas? No? Okay, let's let's move on to the next slide. I, I apologize if, if you're gonna talk, you're gonna have to um, somehow speak up and make sure because I can't see with the slides on, on my, my um, screen. So the next one, um, take a moment to look it over. Okay. 
Again, you guys should be very proud of the work that's being done in the district. It's nice to see these things identified. Talking about a supportive community, a strong PTA, and that we're working with the um, social emotional needs of the students. And um, just in case there's a question, Second Step is apparently a program that we use in the district to work with the students on their social emotional learning. And then obviously the access to the counselors by the uh, counselors and social workers to the students is an important piece. John, I was just gonna ask you what second step is. And thank you for letting me know that you can't see the other um, members on the screen because I have them all up and I'll try to keep track of whether there are questions and let you know if it looks like everybody's silent, okay? I appreciate it. I just don't wanna cut off some of the slide and then not be able to see that. So I do appreciate yeah, I that. Completely understand. Does anybody have any questions or comments about this slide? Excellent. Okay, next slide, please. So the last portion of the uh, strengths, as we can see that one of the strengths was identified is we have a diverse community. And I think there was really an important um, message being sent about the, uh, the use of uh, teacher and grade level leaders as an important tool if we were to move forward with the Princeton plan, because they could be beneficial as we um, have to change and redesign some things in the future if we were to use the, uh, the, the Princeton plan. So again, I open it up to any comments about the strengths, any questions that you may have? Okay, uh, perfect. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Lisa has a question. I do. Yeah, I just was wondering if you could explain to us and help us understand um, number 27. It doesn't appear on the list of the top five that any of the groups chose. And so how did that become part of one of the you know, top seven strengths that was listed? Excellent question, Lisa. So it could have been someone's number two as far as they did their five or say their number six, or they combined it with a couple of other things. But what happened organically through the conversation with the large group, people started talking about, well, I was thinking about putting this one on, or we had that on our list and we pulled it off at the last second. And then someone would advocate for, let's say, number 27, and then explain to the group why they felt that was an important piece to share with the board. And then ultimately at the end, the group made the decision, yes, let's include this one on. Because again, having people explain what they may, they may feel about that particular point, like the, the, uh, the grade level leaders um, was important for the whole group to hear and allowed them to potentially change their mind a little bit or decide to, hey, let's just add it to the board because we think it is important. So though it's not on that original list, that box of those uh, um, report outs, but it is something that came up with our conversation um, with the large group. Thank you. Anybody else have comments or questions? I just want to say myself, I am really pleased to see that this whole list is so focused on how excellent our teaching staff is and our teaching programs. So, you know, we've got a lot of strengths um, identified here and community involvement as well with the uh, PTA presence and their cultural enrichment program. So very encouraging to see that we have such dedicated teachers um, and teaching programs. Okay, the next slide, Greg, please. So sometimes it's easy to do the strengths, right? You, you can sit there and you can list a bunch of strengths and people feel good about themselves. But sometimes the challenge is when you have to start talking about our weaknesses or, or potential threats. And again, think about the group, right? It was made up of community members, um, parents, many of which were on the PTA, are on the PTA as well. Um, so they have a dual role there. You have uh, teachers there and you have administrators there. But we really wanted people to be open and honest about their feelings and they believe that they really were. So again, that's a credit to them as a group. And sometimes it's easy to take these personal, right? When people start pointing out some of the things that you don't do well. And I just wanna caution everybody, the board, administrators, parents, PTA, community members, um, this is just information for us to use to improve. So if you look at it through the lens of, hey, listen, we've got this great information of how we can improve as a district and that's how you utilize it. Don't, work, don't take it personal, use it as a way to grow as a district. So again, you're gonna see some things on here um, that are, are weaknesses of ours. And again, it's, it's as we look to move towards um, the Princeton plan, if that's what you choose to do. Okay, so one of our current weaknesses going on right now in the district, you can see, uh, let me let you look at the slides first and then I'll, I'll go through them real quick. Okay. 
Okay, so under our current plan right now, um, we have some special ed education students that cannot attend their neighborhood school because their programs are in another school building. So that has been identified as a, a, a challenge and a concern or a weakness. Um, the three different elementary schools moving to the middle school tends to lead towards biases. And then this last one, which Joe spoke about a little bit earlier on, but you know, the, the world has turned upside down. Um, we're hopefully right, right, get to turn right side up real soon. But currently right now, they've identified that many of our families um, are fragile um, and they really are concerned about what's gonna happen next year and both the pandemic and their personal lives and school lives. And, and there'll be more to be said about this, but this is definitely something that right now, currently what the district is going through and the community is going through is seen as a potential weakness if we were to move forward. Next slide, please. Sorry. Oh, oh uh, questions, wait, wait. questions, I'm questions. sorry. Lord, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't know if this I don't know if this is the right time to ask because we're going through the process of what you did and um, what do they mean by number six? What do you mean it leads toward biases? Did, is, that, is this the appropriate time to ask that type of question or are you just Ab going through? Absolutely, absolutely. And I'll, I'll do my best to speak on behalf of the group. But my understanding is this, this is that when you bring three different schools together and if some people have some preconceived um, ideas about potential different schools or different areas of the school district, when they now have to come to the middle school as a, a, as a class together, um, it may have people thinking before they even get there that there's some differences among the students as they come through. If that makes sense. I'm, and again, Lori, it's not like, um, I don't want you to think that this is uh, something that um, is a knock against any one school or any one you know, part of the district, but this is just something that came up that people feel that bringing the students together at the middle school after being separated for all of elementary, there, there is some perceived biases going on. Corey? Yeah, I've got a question around neighborhoods. You know, I've heard from parents that they're concerned about, uh, you know, the loss of neighborhoods around the elementary schools. And just been looking in, in some of these documents, I didn't see that specifically called out. And I was wondering if that's because uh, it either wasn't discussed or because it was considered not one of the top priorities. If it's not on, I believe there is a slide on here that will speak to that um, or a portion of the slide that speaks to that a little bit. Um, but I de definitely can tell you that the sense of neighborhood, the sense of elementary school community was definitely spoken about and I think it did rise to the level of coming on here. It may be under the threats later on as one of the discussion points. Okay, then may, maybe, again, it, I, yeah, maybe I missed it. I just wanna make sure, so we've been hearing a lot about that recently. I just wanna make sure it's at least called out. Yeah, it was definitely spoken about it. Again, I, I, I apologize, and, you know, we finished on Monday night late and um, you got all the documents. I, I recognize you got them today, I believe. So it's a lot to read. And again, Corey, there, there could be more to come to, the, to that issue um, in this presentation. If not, you can go through the other documents or, or we can do it together and I can discuss that with you. But clearly the neighborhood school and being part of the school community was definitely brought up um, during our discussion. Okay, thanks. Allie. Sorry, probably with my mute. Um, number five, I don't think many um, community members know this. If you don't have a, a child in the special ed system, can you just, um, for the sake of uh, educating our community, what does that mean, number five? So you have the best person on, 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 the, on, the, on the meeting tonight that can speak to this, Lisa, but my understanding is, and Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, is that if a student's in a specialized program and there's not enough students in that particular neighborhood school that they could house that program in the school, that they have to pull students together from different schools to run that program. So, um, no, um, really what okay, it I'm is, sorry. I'm sorry for my voice if I lose it, um, really what it is is that students are split amongst the district, so not all special ed students are in one building. So before I got here, there was a rotation of where each um, cohort would be. For example, um, next year's cohort of kindergartners for ICT would go to um, Furnace Woods. First grade uh, is going to be at uh, Frank G. So each building has different levels. There's no more than two uh, grade levels of special ed in each building that are ICT. If they're specialized classes, not resource room, 
but if they're specialized ICT, ICT skills, um, our 12 on ones or ABCs, they're in specific buildings. So it's just that if the program isn't there and the families don't want to move their students, they revoke consent for their IEP so the students don't get services. So we already have some students that are, if you live in Furnace Woods, but you're, the service you need is a PV, we have some students that have to go across yes. town. Okay, yeah. thank you. Or they just uh, revoke consent, which means students do not get any specialized um, instruction or special education. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Well, you have the expert in the room, so thank you, Lisa, I appreciate it. Any other questions on this slide? Um, yeah, I, I have questions actually. Uh, so that was identified as a weakness of going to the Princeton plan, but we're already transporting students across the district for a certain program. So I didn't understand why that was considered a weakness that was identified if we had decided to go to the Princeton plan. Again, it's something that I think right now that the, um, the district um, recognizes that that may not be ideal. And if you move to the Princeton plan and continued that practice, which you may have to, just depending on the numbers, um, they just wanted to make sure that you, again, what you're gonna use this for is to do everything possible to make this not happen, right? To have kids um, in the same grade levels working together. So if it was in the Princeton plan, you, you would try the best you can to have the kindergartners and first graders and their special ed programs among their peers right there in the building. The same would be true for third and fourth, and then, uh, I mean, uh, second and third, and then fourth and fifth. Right, but there is a possibility that in the future, if you have uh, a small number of kids, that you may have to be not necessarily with their peers. So your job as a school district would say, okay, this has been recognized as something that's not great for kids right now. If we would move to the Princeton plan, our ideal situation would be to have their kids with their classmates, the same grade levels, not necessarily their neighborhood school, obviously, but with their same the students of the same grade level. Okay, thank you, and then. Uh... I have another comment, but does anybody else have a comment before I make another comment? Okay, so number 10, that many children, families in our school community are fragile right now, socially and emotionally due to the impact of the pandemic in their personal lives and with school. They don't know what is happening next year. I just wanted to make a, it's not so much a question as a comment. We have been getting a lot of um, emails from our community members and we are reading all of them and we're certainly sympathetic to, you know, the COVID situation at the moment and what what families are going through. So I am not surprised to see this on this list and you know we do hear you. Okay. Thank you. Next next slide please if there's no more questions. Great. Greg, next slide please. Oh you already got it up there. Look they look the same. I'm sorry. Um, so again I'll give you a moment to look through these. Okay, so the first one, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, except for maybe the district facilities. And I think that piece, it really relates to somewhat um, your location to another building. So for example, we heard that the Frank G. Lindsay students have the opportunity to use the track. They have the opportunity to do potentially a play on the stage at the high school. Um, that's where that one goes to. The other ones I think are you know, clear that they, there's a belief that the class sizes, actually there is, the class sizes are different, a little funding difference. And then some of the programs are a little different between the different buildings. The next, the next two, 34, 36, um, was really a very interesting conversation. It's about the difference between equity and equality. And one of the things they want you know, you to understand is as we look to move to the future, we wanna make sure that students are getting what they need to be successful, not that they're not, you know, we're not trying that now, but um, equal does not necessarily mean it's um, what students need to be successful. So that was a, a very good conversation. And then the last one uh, speaks to the current class size caps being too large. Again, everybody recognizes that there's some financial strain in the district, but one of the concerns moving forward is if we were to max out the class sizes, um, again, going to the cap, um, that may not be a good experience for the students and it doesn't seem to be um, educationally sound to do that according to the group. So again, um, this is the, I believe, the last slide under the weaknesses. So if you have any questions, I'll try to do my best to um, answer them. I just found out that Mary Pat's been trying to ask questions and she hasn't been able to get in. 
Oh, boy. And um, I'm sorry, Mary so Pat. We're trying, we're trying to unmute her, but we might have to go back a little bit. That's fine. Can she write in her questions and then make an answer them that way? Would that work? That might work. And in the meanwhile, while we're figuring out the technical difficulties, I'm really sorry, Mary Pat. Oh, she's signing back out on another oh, great. screen I see. Hopefully that'll solve the problem. But does anybody else have any questions while we're trying to figure out this technical issue? Allie? Um, does anybody know um, our current class size caps? They're under state requirements, correct? Can somebody confirm that for me? That's my understanding. Um, it would be the best answer to that one, Joe. Yeah, I, I don't believe so. We have a board policy that sets our caps. And the board policy also um, talks about how we remedy situations if we have, uh, if we exceed the cap. For example, it's not that we always hire an additional teacher, maybe it's an additional teaching assistant, depends on the time of year, those sort of things. Um, the teacher's contract references class size but as a recommendation not a not a mandate the only mandate we have is uh internal mandate and that's our board of education policy uh, so there's not state mandates for class sizes i don't not that i'm aware of um okay. there very well could be but not that i'm aware of right now the only ones i'm aware of is is if um we had a universal pre-K program. Um, the demands on pre-K are no more than 18 children. Okay, so as, as a board policy, if, I don't know, maybe I'm getting ahead of the process, but that's something that we could consider down the line reconsidering uh, is lowering the, cast, the cast, class cap, right? Sure, yeah, that's a policy decision uh, discussion for the board to have when we've had it before. Um, we've looked at um, the trajectory of, of future enrollment, and we've looked at trends in the rearview mirror, and then we we determined whether or not that would necessitate more staff, and then the budget implication, those sort of things. Thank you. Now, to your point, which was a good one, um, this information would be used as you start developing your action plan if you were to decide to move forward and restructure the elementary school. You would use this information and say, okay, what do we need to do to address the class size cap, right? And then we would either put that in our action plan or choose not to. So that's how you would actually use all of this information moving forward. I'll chime in, um, being, being a teacher. I don't know why there's any confusion to tell you the truth. Um, especially in this pandemic, I, I just got a little heated with 34 and 36. And I know it's just this process of what the people have gone through. But let me tell you something that we give everything, everything, every teacher in this district, every teacher that I work with, especially under this COVID situation has gone way above and beyond anything to meet the needs of children, to help them to be successful. So I, I kind of take, I, I know I shouldn't be, and I probably shouldn't be voicing this right now because you know this is, this is the process that we went through. But, but let me tell you parents, just like you are doing yours at home, we are doing it in school too, whether it's mandated or not, whether a kid needs help. I have kids texting me right now for math help or reading help. That's why you see me looking down because they need help with their homework. We're doing Zooms with them at no matter what time. We're meeting them at McDonald's or we're meeting them. We are doing everything built in or not built in to help these kids do whatever they need to succeed. We're bringing them food, we're bringing them clothing, we're bringing them stuff, whatever they need. We're giving them extra time. We're working with their, with, with their work schedules because I work with big kids, high school kids. So please, um, please know that that is happening and equity and equality, even though they're different, they are kind of the same too, to tell you the truth. So please do not worry that your children are not being treated equitably or equally because I kind of take a little offense to that, to tell you the truth, because I know what me and my colleagues and I know what many of the teachers in Hen Hud are doing. So please um, just know that <laughs> everything is, is going on to help your kids be as successful as possible. I love That's your all. passion. <laughs> I, I love your passion about it. And again, I think this, this is just good information to have. And um, I know, I know. I went off track with that a little bit because I, I know where you went through the process and I'm getting. <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're good. And I think you're passionate about it. And I think that's important. And I think it's just, again, you know, there just may be a communication or just a couple of meetings that may have to occur to explain, 
you know, what we are actually doing in the district as it relates to um, each of the students. And um, you saw some really good things early on of it said that, you know, all students are getting a great education. There's things there in place to help students if they're struggling with the different resources that are out there. So um, it's just, again, one piece of the puzzle that you need to just look at. And again, you want to try if this is a perceived weakness or it actually is a weakness, you have to address it in order to move forward. But I love your passion. Could I, I, I know. It, John. <laughs> John, could I interrupt? Just I want to just address what Lori said. So Lori, number one, let me just say as a teacher, I agree with everything you just said a thousand percent. But let me also say that that's not what the group intended by 34 and 36. What they are looking at here, I believe, is that in schools, we often say that school gets one reading teacher, this school gets a reading teacher, that school gets a reading teacher, even though in one school, the need might be twice as much as another school. So we have a tendency to, to do our staffing that way. And I think that reflects the fact that giving everybody the same amount of things is not helpful if one school or two schools or three schools have more need. So it's about looking across the board and giving every school what they need to be successful, not giving everybody the same amount of something. Right, that's what I thought 21 yeah. was. Okay. I was thinking 21 was inequities between the- With a little bit of that also in there. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that it comes across in multiple ways. Um, and that reference in 21 to programs actually in the conversation was about the fact that our curriculum is really tight. We have truly amazing um, teachers, especially at the elementary level, working together across three schools really to make sure that that curriculum is consistent. That's not an easy thing to do. So all credit to them. But even they are willing to admit that if we're all teaching the same curriculum, but I have 25 kids and you have 12, there's a difference there in how that instruction gets played out for those students. I don't have as much time if I have twice as many kids to give every kid what they need. So there was, there was some, I thought it was a very rich conversation Monday night. I will definitely agree with John, especially in the group that I was in. So I just you know wanted to clarify a little bit. Oh, I, I agree with you and everything that you said, I thought was in 21. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking programs in between buildings. So when I, then I saw the sentence being worried about treating kids equally yeah. doesn't mean like, yeah, no. so my thought was coming that way for 34 and 36. I gotcha. But again, again, I know this was a process and this is what perception and a little bit of education goes goes a far way. Yes. Okay. And Thanks. Just so just, just, you know, Margaret, please feel free to jump in sooner so we, we don't get Lori's blood pressure going so much. She said, <laughs> that was a great explanation. And uh, that's exactly how the group spoke. So good summary there, Margaret. I definitely appreciate that. Yeah, thank Before you. If any of the administrators, you know, want to jump in and clarify anything for us, that that would be fantastic. Definitely Hopefully. helpful for me, for sure. Um, Mary Pat, it looks like your phone is unmuted. Are you able to talk now? Oh, yeah, I, I guess. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I sure can. Yes. Yay. Yes. Uh, well, here's my question. I mean, I've been re looking at this and I don't understand, like, you have it listed as a weakness. These things aren't going to change. Like, there's some confusion between equity and equality. We're still going to be giving everybody whatever they need, you know, whether it's equity, equality. We're not going to change cap sizes. We're not going to change inequities. Everything, those things are going to stay the same. The special ed kids are still going to wind up having to, um, you know, go where their program is. Whether, and it's not always based on their their age group. Um, you know, and it, it seems to a certain extent, I'm not sure, like these, you specify their weaknesses, but, you know, it's, I don't quite understand where those things are going to change. So it's, I mean, are we going to make the current class cap sizes are too large? Or does that mean we're going to make, we're going to make every, what, third grade class 24 kids now? not have you know 20 and some and 24 in other schools or, or or 18 or whatever the numbers it's the the cap sizes now we're we're actually going to approach larger cap sizes be i mean ideally you know that's part of the problem that's part of the logic in doing this so you can even it out and 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 not have these sort of you know um you know hang on class you know these classes because of the way it's split to have like these you know odd sizes 
Um, so I'm Pat, not quite sure why that would be considered a, a weakness. So Mary Pat, I mean, you're spot that's on not as far going as. To change. So that's not um, change. Here, here's what I would say to you about that. So um, you're spot on as far as um, looking at this through the lens of what would we do next. But um, in order to do that, you have to have the action plan uh, process. So as the board and as the administration looks at these different things, um, certain things you may choose to address, certain things you may say, you know what, we just can't do it. But it doesn't stop the group from presenting what they believe are some of the weaknesses. So for example, the class size cap is something that they're concerned about. But as we know, the, the board and the administration sometimes has to make some difficult decisions and if you choose in your action so, plan not not to address it, that's fine. That's that's the role of well, the board and the administration. In looking at this, just in general, are we looking when you put strengths and weaknesses, opportunities? Are we looking at this as strengths and weaknesses of the the district of the going with the Princeton plan of the benefits there? You know that will help us go with the Princeton plan or not go, depending on whatever it is. I mean, because you look at some of these these situations. I mean. The, for this change, the community is supportive of education. That's not going to change. The community is supportive of our education. That's not going to change. We have a diverse community. That's not going to change. I mean, is this considered a, I mean, to, to a certain extent, why is this being highlighted? Because that's not something that's going to change no matter what in terms of, you know, I mean, how we're looking at this, this you know, this possibility. I but mean, with the hopefully. Strengths. Yep. So Mary Pat, with the strengths, what you want to do is you want to maximize them. You want to utilize them as you move forward with this plan. So you 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 brought up um, yeah. a community that's supportive yeah. of, 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 of the district, right? So you want to use that community to help you as you develop the plan, which is obviously something you're doing right now with the stakeholder group and having meetings like this. So they're going to be giving you some input to help you because they are supportive of the school district. You know, when you look at the diversity, how can we use the diversity as a positive thing as we move forward with this plan? What things can we do to enhance um, the use of the diversity in, in our new structure, right? So as you look at these different items, you're going to look at how do I, you know, maximize my strengths? How do I overcome my weaknesses if I can, right? If, if we can't overcome them, then we, we just lay that out that we couldn't, we couldn't change that weakness. We want to know that it's there. We don't want to lose sight of it. So all this information is really just to help you guide, uh, help guide you as you start developing your plan to move forward, one way or the other, either restructuring or not. Um, so it's not like they're asking you to change it; they're actually giving you information so you realize that this is how they are seeing things and how they, what they believe are important to you, uh, important for you as you make this decision. And again, this is something that you can utilize the entire document for, you know, the 202 to look at, and you may say, you know what? As a board, we think, you know, strength number, you know, 37 is the most important one. It wasn't even listed in our PowerPoint presentation. You can utilize that in your action plan where you can address a weakness that's not necessarily listed here. But as a committee, they try to provide you with information of things that are important for us and things that they believe will help you make this decision if you move forward. Okay, I like I said, I mean, for example, as I said, the weaknesses, I to a certain extent, it sort of seems like, you know, it, it doesn't seem like something when you look at it, something that might be a problem and holding us back. I mean, it's, it's, it's to a certain extent, it's irrelevant, because it's, it's not going to change. I mean, again, I don't foresee cap class sizes. I mean, part of this was, I don't see the class sizes, you know, the cap size is changing. So it's sort of like, you know, the cap I don't know. It just seems a little. Um, but that, but that this information is there, but it's really not. It's it's again. It's not going to change. Nothing's going to. It doesn't change. It's like so that impact. If it's going to be the same on either, it's not going to have the impact. Is my point. So it sort of seems a little. Um, well, it, it, I mean, again, I, I get, so, technically, technically, if the district got an influx of no. uh, finances and you could make the decision at some point to lower the class cap, I'm not I'm not advocating for that. But um, the group would be remiss if they didn't add this in there as something that they're concerned about. So it's something that's happening now that there's a little bit of concern about that we're creeping up on the cap. And then if the opportunity presents itself in the future, near future for, you know, 10 years from now where you could lower that cap, cap size, this will be something that you could potentially do. And I'm not saying that you're in a position to do that right now, but for the stakeholders group, it was important to, for them to share what they felt was one of the weaknesses. 
So it's basically weaknesses of for the district, not necessarily that that to in going forward on anything else. So this theoretically could be used on any particular project we want for the district, not necessarily just the Princeton plan. Correct. Theoretically. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're right on. Are we okay to move on to the next slide? I think we are. Okay, great. So after going through the first half of the presentation with the large group, we then broke back into small groups and then they discussed the opportunities and threats. And again, the opportunities could be some strengths that we want to you know, take further, or it could be things out there that we currently don't have that we could take, take advantage of. And some of the threats could be some of our weaknesses that would be exasperated if we moved into this and become a real big threat. Or are there things out there that were um, threatening, uh, could potentially threaten the plan? So this one's easy, right? If you look at the cross the top, everybody picked number one as their top top one across, right? And then there was a whole mix of different numbers in there, you know, fours and groups of three and those kind of things. But if you look at the opportunities, number one clearly rose to the top. And then anything that wasn't really highly picked by all the groups, again, we then had a long discussion. And as Joe said, we went for about three hours. And, and um, again, I have to applaud the group for their hard work on this. So we'll go through the same exercise with opportunities, potential opportunities out there, and then we'll talk about the threats. Next slide. Oh, yep, there you go. So I'll give you an opportunity to um, read that. Any comments or questions about this slide? I think one is pretty self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. And the second one to me seems to, to kind of mirror the other concern that when kids go to middle school that there is a um, perception of difference in the students that mm -hmm. there's, yeah, right? Yeah, so this yes. would be an opportunity to correct that. And you'll see that again, again a little bit this. later on, I think in another, another portion of this, this presentation. I, I love the last sentence in there. And, and I think we heard this loud and clear with all the, the different districts that we spoke to that one of the things that really resonated was th that everybody from day one would be part of Sailor Nation, you know, and, and all feeling as, as one group. Any questions or comments about this slide? Yeah, John, I just wanna, you know, that last one, I mean, we all know it's a great opportunity for that, but did you hear of many parents that felt differently about that? Felt differently about the separation piece? Yeah. Um, I think we heard we heard comments, and again, you'll see some later on. Um, I think when you look at some of the threats, and again, I think there's uh, some people who really feel strongly about the sense of community at the elementary school and the the, the kids working together there. But I, I do think that um, at the in the end, I don't think anyone disagreed necessarily with this particular um, part of the slide. That you know, really clearly, everybody would be part of feeling from the beginning one school district. I think. Currently, as it stands now, each of the elementary schools, I think, have their own names, I guess. I, I, don't, know if, I don't know what each of them are. But um, so to answer your question, Corey, I, we did hear it. There's no question. We heard some people feeling very strongly about keeping the elementary schools and having their own identities and their own communities. There's no question about that. And again, I think you'll see that later on. OK. All right. Thank you. If, I, like may, if I may. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I've been on the board for 12 years and I think for 12 years, I have asked for that to be changed. Like the one elementary school is one thing, one elementary is another thing. I'm like, and I said, we are all one district. So I don't know why we're just not all blue and white and all the same thing and all sailors, whether you're mini shipmates or whatever. But, but yes, I agree with that. Whether we do this plan or not, that, that should just be the way it is anyway. They actually are all the same color. I was going to say, aren't we all blue and white now? No. Yes. No. Yes. They, they're not. They because they they are. The, I know. What Frank color is Lindsay Frank G? Except, what color is Frank G? And what blue color and is white. blue and white? Everything outside that blue building is red. That's because they haven't what? painted it yet. <laughs> uh, and, but the kids wear blue and white. Another discussion. Another discussion. Yeah, that could be a, day, a, a nice debate for another day, um, for sure. Another um, discussion. There you go. Anything else about this particular slide? 
Perfect. Great. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So again, an, another opportunity here, um, you know, the first one uh, up on this particular slide is talking about really matching students up well in the, in the buildings. So for example, if you have a school currently right now that only has two, two classes at a particular grade level, there's not a lot of opportunities to mix kids up, right? To meet both their academic and their social emotional needs. Under the Princeton's plan, you'll have eight to nine potential sections. So there's a good chance to do that. And then obviously you can match students with teachers that would work well with them. And, and not that all, all teachers work well with kids, but there may be a better fit between the teachers and, and particular students. And then the other one at the bottom really speaks about their friendships and the people that they can meet up with, with both the students and the families. Um, but particularly students can now have a larger pool of students, uh, friends to pick from that may have similar interests as they do. Margaret, do you want to flesh this one out a little bit? Um, so, you know, uh, let, let's start with 19 and 31. So it is much easier when you are, um, as a principal, you have seven, nine, 10 sections where you can spread students out for a variety of reasons. Um, and I know um, oftentimes, you know, we tend to think that small is good, but if you're Furnace Woods and you only have two sections of each grade level, you have very limited ways in which you can pair people. Um, that, that's both a, a issue of matching teacher student personalities, matching student to student personalities. Uh, so, you know, that's an important thing to consider. Uh, it also goes back to class size as well. Um, when you have uh, more sections on a grade level, one more student that comes in isn't likely to tip you into, uh-oh, new section territory because you have the ability to spread kids out better. Uh, I, I love the fact that they talked also in this particular bullet about students being um, placed with some intentionality around social and emotional needs. So again, the more variety you have, the better your chances are of making a match that benefits both students and teachers. Um, and in 27, we talked a lot about that opportunity to have a, a, just a greater pool of friends. Someone in the group Monday night mentioned that, by the way, our elementary students who are fully remote are mixed across three schools. So um, a, one of our remote teachers has kids from all three buildings potentially. Um, and someone mentioned that uh, kids made friends and, and you know realized that they would never have known that child if it wasn't for this opportunity because there are two completely different elementary schools even though they're in the same grade. Um, so you know those are interesting opportunities for our students to grow together from the very beginning. When kids come into kindergarten, and I say this as a former kindergarten teacher, the only thing they're interested in is a friend. They want someone to play with, they want someone to have lunch with, potentially to sit on the bus with or walk home with. They don't care about anything else at that age, that's all they're interested in. So we, we would, you know, we embrace that. And um, while we understand the neighborhood schools, um, many of us grew up in neighborhood schools, we also see the opportunities that exist as kids are exposed to a broader group of potential friends. Thank you. Does anybody have questions or comments about this slide? Lori? <laughs> you saw me on mute. <laughs> um, yeah. You know what, this is going to be a very um, difficult decision down the road. It, it truly is because there's pros and cons and we all know that, right? So what I, my first thought was, well, there's not gonna be a fifth grader to go down to read to the kindergartner or there's not gonna be the big buddy or the big sister or any modeling of older kids or any, you know, that's what I was thinking. So, so many times you have your fifth graders go read to your kindergartners and, or do math with them or go out and, you know, who's going to referee or something like that. So I, I saw that missing right away. Yep. But like we said, there's going to be, right. We're just have to You're absolutely right, Lori. And I do think that that comes up, I think in the threats, John, I'm not positive, yes. but we did talk a lot about that. And, um, you know, the remedy to that is intentionality. So um, you plan for those things to happen. Um, they absolutely can continue to happen. And they almost start to feel like a field trip and get very special. 
um, to have buddies across the school. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that I don't know if it's on the list or not. I know we did talk about that um, Monday yep, it's night. On the list. Yep, okay. it absolutely is on the list. And again, when you when you look at some of the threats, which that is clearly one of them, you try to ward off. What things can we do to stop that from being a threat? And that's where the action plan comes in. So we would say on that one, and I'm not advocating one way or the other here, we need to make opportunities throughout the year for students to have older role models to be buddies with and, and to have opportunities for the older students to work with the younger students. Allie? Um, but that, that can happen within a grade level or within a, a classroom of fifth graders. You, you, you have the opportunity to learn from your peer role models right in that classroom. Um, so while it might be a, a threat, I think there, it's not a, a complete loss. I think there's opportunities within, um, within even a classroom that, you know, I've seen my kids, my kid doesn't understand something. So he makes a, his own little Google meet with a friend and they, and they're meeting together. So there's that learning and um, role modeling. And um, I think that's, is actually a strength and an opportunity. Thank you. Anybody else comments, questions? All right, I think we can go on. Okay, so I'll let you get a chance to read this and All right, I'm gonna kick things off by looking at number 30. Um, can you talk about the how the um, transition is gonna help with targeted reading groups? That sort of seems to be- Okay, you know, so I, about I, I just- And then not targeted reading groups and then back to being scary for students and parents. Yeah, so th this, is, this is a facilitator's uh, mistake here. So there should be another number in there. So there was a, a conversation that occurred about um, this particular topic. So there is there is one of the numbers in there that talks about when you move to the middle school coming from one school building, um, it's a better opportunity for the, the middle school to provide reading groups for uh, targeted reading groups for those students. So where this went from was talking about the transition, right, and, and the ability to um, move with your peers, and you're doing it multiple times. So when you get to the middle school, um, you're not at the, you're not, you're not as, it's not as scary as it was if it was the first time you've moved. So that's the first portion of it. You should see another number up in here. And, and believe me when I tell you, I will be correcting this because it's going to drive me crazy. But clearly in some of the opportunities, there's a list, uh, I, I remember clearly, um, where it talked about the, uh, um, the reading group. So that should have been up there as well. And then the last part of, part of it um, is really just what I first talked about is it won't be as scary uh, for student and parents because they've had the opportunity to transition multiple times. So I think there's three numbers that should be up there. And unfortunately, I made a mistake and only put the one. Should be 16 I, as well, John. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to, if I start pulling no, out papers it now, it's going to, but so, no, I'm, I'm telling sure you, it's, it's 16. Oh, perfect. I can't see you speaking, but thank you. It's Lisa. So. Thanks, Lisa. Margaret, you're unmuted. Did you want to jump in or you're just unmuted by accident? No, I, I didn't. Um, I was going to say basically what, what John ended up saying, which was I think there's a couple of things in here that didn't, you know, show up. I, I don't have my list in front of me, so I wouldn't have been able to tell you it was 16. So thank you, Lisa. Yes. And then, and then obviously the, the, the second one here talks about potential future opportunities for us in, in these different areas. And again, this is this is a combination of six and seven. And then the last one really speaks to, you know, you're at the grade level and you have kids who are in kindergarten, first grade. So obviously assemblies can be geared towards them, but the language that you use in the building, whether it's, whether it's um, code of conduct or how, how kids are addressed um, by the staff there, it's obviously it's appropriate for each of the great different grade line, the grade levels. Any questions or comments about this slide? I have a question. In terms sure. of the innovation opportunities, um, you know, you talk about the, the dual language. Why? What would preclude that from happening? If it, you know, and I mean, why would that not happen? Any? I mean, 
it is an opportunity in any situation, um, in any in any you know uh, structure. So um, how is it better? Um, I mean, wh why why is that? You know, it reads oh. like we wouldn't have it otherwise. Like it's an opportunity if we go this way. Um, you know, if we go to the Princeton plan, why why couldn't it happen if we stayed in neighborhood schools? Well, you would, the reason that it's looked at as an opportunity, Mary Pat, is because it doesn't add staff. So right now we're taking staff away as we move to the Princeton plan. You could then say these two teachers that we would be getting rid of, we would be accessing, could now become our foreign language teachers, as opposed to staying the way we are and remaining in the position that we're in. We're definitely adding staff to do any of these items. It's not a substitute or a retrofit of FTE. It's new FTE. I and what would be well, the, yes, then what would be the it, purpose? It Thank you. The, idea, the whole idea of this was saving money. You know, a big piece of it was saving money. And if yes, we're exactly. keeping people and, and that the cost savings were going to be, you know, teachers, you know, teachers being, you know, less teachers being teachers being excess. So if we're not, if we're keeping these teachers and just, you know, just sort of re redirecting them or having them uh, reassigning them, then that money is not saved. So we are basically, it's, it's, it's a pro, it's just, I guess, in this case, they would be saying giving them more opportunities, but, um, you know, the kids, but it doesn't, it's not going to save us money. So, uh, again, this whole, the, a big chunk of the Princeton plan, the, the big, the driver has been the, the, the cost savings. And now we're sort of like, you know, cutting into the cost savings if we're talking about adding these, and, and I, Trust me, I think these programs are lovely, but the whole purpose was to save money. And that sort this sort of defeats, you know, it it it, it lessens the amount of money we're saving and, and it sort of makes the upheaval that we're going to see um you know again it minim it lessens the amount of money that we're that that's the whole argument here. The big chunk of the argument is saving money and this changes that. So let me just speak to that again real quickly. I apologize, but Remember in the beginning, I talked about this group was charged with what's possible. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's but what's possible if we move to this plan, right? It's not that it's impossible. And again, they're going to give you information. There's information in here that you have a decision to make. Now, if you choose to use what uh, Margaret said and say, hey, listen, we can take some of our current money that we have available and make a dual language program at a, at a certain grade level, you know, right? You can choose to do that. You can also choose not to do that because right now the main focus of the board is to really make sure that they keep the budget very tight. And um, But we don't want to go into this. We didn't want the group to go into to say, hey, listen, we, we really don't want you to think that there's any possibilities of any, anything potentially in the future that you can look at if we were move, move towards the Princeton plan. So again, for the board, this is just information of what people are thinking, what, what it was out there. And then you guys can pick and choose as you develop your action plan the direction you want to move. And again, you have more information potentially about budget and future budgets and future taxes that are going to be coming on. And um, who knows what's going to happen in the district five years from now, but this document will live forever. So you could say, okay, five years from now, if, if the opportunity presents itself, we may be able to bring back some of these programs. Is there some ways that we can look at things currently with staffing and do the same thing with the current staff to bring some of these programs in, right? Can we work on developing the social studies and science programs with our current staff, that would be next year. Is there ways to, to work on STEAM? The answer to that is absolutely. Um, may not be the main targeted area that you guys select and may not necessarily involve addition, you know, taking away from your current savings by moving to the Princeton plan. That's completely the board's decision with the administration in, involved in that. From what I understood from previous discussions that that if we wanted to do, say, a science program, I'm going to pick that one mm -hmm. um, because I'm a sciencey person, and it would be way more cost effective if we wanted to do a fourth and fifth grade science program if all of the fourth and fifth graders were in the same building than if we were trying to institute that same science program across three different buildings. Is that no correct? Question. Yeah, no question about it. Yeah, if you try to replicate it in all three buildings, you're gonna it's gonna be a staffing issue potentially. 
Dr. or Margaret, you want to speak to that at all before we move on? Or? Yeah, I'll just, I, I think this all depends on especially that specific topic, number six and seven combined, speaks to what lens you're looking at it. We began this, this, um, this study by looking at it from a financial lens. What we know is that if we pick up our current model and reorganize in a Princeton plan model, we would have the potential. Let's, let's say it's not a cost analysis. We're just looking at what would our staffing look like? Look at it from the lens of staffing. If we move to a Princeton plan um, with, with no financial expectation, um, as John said, what, dream a little bit. What could we do? What could we have? We would have 14 extra teachers. What could the district do by reallocating 14 additional teachers with having every single grade level at class sizes between 21 and 24, I think it was. Um, so so take, the, take the impetus off from, or, or take it away from looking at it financial and just look at it from an opportunity standpoint. And we had this discussion a few weeks ago um, where we said, uh, you know, part of the conversation among the committee is, okay, uh, moving to the Princeton plan provides the opportunity to save a lot of money and keep our program the same. The Princeton plan also could provide an opportunity uh, to save some money and enhance the existing program. And conversations I had with many community members was basically, sorry for the analogy, but what's the carrot? What's the carrot to convince me that reorganizing children and having them go to different elementary schools, how will their experience be different? What will they experience in the Princeton plan that they wouldn't normally experience at you name it school grades K through six or K through five. And that's where this conversation, uh, how this conversation was, was generated. Again, just for the, for the little historical, when, when we started working with this group on the SWOT analysis, one of the things that I shared with them, as I mentioned earlier, was that the board went through a similar process when we talked about the closing of Indian Point. And if you think back then, you think, okay, we know what our strengths are as a district. We know what some of our weaknesses are. But how can we even look at this as an opportunity, right? Like, like we're going to lose so much money. How could we even come up with a list for opportunities? And I remember the board doing a really good job speaking about, hey, it's a chance for us to look at what we're doing, see if we can do it better, and continue to provide high quality education for all of our students. And you've done a wonderful job with that. And from that, when the action plan came, all right, let's look at our current programs. And that was the study that was done, I think, two years ago, looking at the current um, programs at all the different levels. So Again, this is just, if you wanna move in this direction, you can move in this direction or you can choose not to. So um, again, uh, I, I just think it's uh, important to remember that these are just thoughts, but at the end of the day, the board and the administration are gonna develop the action plan and implement it in the future. All right, thank you. Anything else before we move on to threats? Okay, All right. next slide, please. Okay. So um, I'll give you a chance to read through them. So obviously the, the first um, bullet here speaks to the losing, uh, the loss of staff the potential impact it's going to have because many people feel, feel very highly, uh, speak highly of your staff. They think they're wonderful. And, and as we all know, based on education regulations, right, um, you know, the last person in a particular department, maybe it has to be the first one to go if there's going to be cuts. So I think that um, some people were sensitive to that as we had this discussion. Um, obviously, when there's new teachers involved, you want to get them to, to, to um, learn about your district and market providing uh, professional development. Um, there's been a lot of resources invested in new teachers as they come on board. Um, and then the last part of this is not necessarily that we're going to lose programs or lose course offerings. It's more about the shuffling of staff could impact um, programs and courses, both at the middle school and the high school level. So I just want to be clear on that. Because some teachers who may be currently at the elementary level or the middle school level or the high school level would have to be shifted in order to... Um, Keep the programs going. And then the last one is no surprise. Uh, it ties into the transportation and as you can see the concerns there. 
John, I just have a quick question on that at 48. Yeah. So we, we had a long talk about this in the last Corey, meeting. Hang on. Enrique um, wanted to oh, say sorry, something. Enrique. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just want to make two comments about the impact on transportation. First of all, is that our transportation aid uh, will increase substantially. So there will be a savings in transportation. Number two, uh, about the impact on the environment, Liz and I have been uh, working very diligently in starting to look at electric vehicle buses. So even though today is still a threat, we're hoping that in the future um, we'll have a hybrid bus fleet. And also Enrique, if I remember the last time we talked about this, the wear and tear on the buses was negligible because we had our own maintenance crew uh, that there would not be additional oil changes or maintenance issues um, that we were assured of that in the last meeting. So yes. I'm not sure that this is quite accurate. Like I, I could understand like an increase in fuel, but we were talking $15,000 in total. And, and Liz assured us that there was no increase in wear and tear on the buses. So while I think it's gonna be longer for some students, it's going to be shorter for others, depending on where you go. So, you know, I know my kids, it's a 40 minute ride for them from where we are to the high school. So we've already got students who are going 40 to 45 minutes on the bus anyway. Um, there were times where they were shorter. So I have a feeling it's going to, you know, I don't know if the bus routes are truly gonna be that much longer than they are right now. It's probably gonna balance out over time. I agree, example. I totally agree. I mean, and again, uh, I think that the, the routes are short. They're going to be a little bit longer, but not, no, but not more for five to 10 minutes. And definitely there's going to be uh, an increase in revenue for the school district. So on and all, uh, it's, it's positive in that sense. Uh, yes, uh, some people, today are in the bus less than five minutes that at one point in their lives for two for two years will be 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. That's a threat, but in general, I can tell you that from the transportation standpoint, uh, everything is positive. We don't need more drivers. We don't need more buses. Uh, so we made the study and from the transportation standpoint, I think that some of these threats will be mitigated. And can you just um, just re-explain for, for those who are listening in uh, why we're going to be getting more transportation aid? Sure, Corey. Um, today, we pick up uh, certain, certain students that live less than a mile and a half or a mile from their school districts. Any person, any student that uh, 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 lives within a mile or mile, mile and a half of their school district, we don't get transportation aid. So now, for example, if today we have someone from Harper Avenue that goes to Frangilinsi, we don't get aid on that, uh, on that kid. But if that kid goes to Furnas Woods or goes to Buchanan, then we'll get the aid. So in that sense, we'll, uh, uh, it was an estimate of additional aid of about $150,000, if I'm not mistaken. If you take, uh, if you take into account that our uh, uh, fuel cost will increase by 15,000, so you, we're up $135,000. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. This is a perfect example of, you know, if you don't know the answer to the question, right? It is a fear of the unknown. So, you know, I know the district has made many efforts to communicate exactly what Enrique has said to the community, but this is an opportunity once again for you to just, again, ward off against this threat. What can you provide to the parents and the community that are gonna say during your action plan development that we can have another meeting or have other ways to communicate to the community 
that this is particular issue that was identified as a potential threat, and I say potential on purpose, um, is not really a threat, as Enrique just explained. But there's obviously a perception out there that these are going to be issues. Thank you. Can I just talk to the I'm cutting of the staff positions? Um, yeah. That is, you know, heartbreaking for everybody. We do sympathize with that if we if we end up having to excess people, and we do put a lot of. Um, time and energy and resource into our young teachers. We want them to feel comfortable in our school community and we want them to be successful. And we hope that they have taken something out of that as well. So, you know, we as a board also see that as a loss to our district. Don't think that we don't. Um, the good news is that if we do end up having to lose teachers that they do have the um, option to come back to our district and then get first right of refusal if there's a position open for them. I don't know if Joe, you wanna talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, there are many different acronyms for it. Um, one I'm familiar with is, is PEL, P-E-L, Preferred Eligibility List. Basically, um, <clears throat> if staff are laid off, they have the opportunity um, to return to a, a similar position. Um, I believe they have a seven year window to do that. So, um, you know, we have, we have been operating, as you've heard from our team before, um, you know, being very transparent with staff saying, okay, you know, you may be, you know, one of the, one of the positions um, that could be reduced. Uh, no decision has been made. No decision will be made for a little bit, but, you know, we can help you uh, gauge your options and walk them through the process. And I know that the teachers union leadership has been equally um, uh, involved and, and has taken this on with a level of significance, but uh, if staff are laid off, they do have uh, eligibility to return up to seven years to a similar position. Thank you. I think I think Mary Pat, did you have a comment? Yeah, I'm still. Uh, it's the, the transportation, the amount of time on the bus. I mean, I, I just, you know, it says the impact. Of, yes, the increased cost of fuel, wear and tear. I mean, I appreciate that we're going to get more money back from the state, but it's still going to cost us more to to run these. Um, and these children, I, I don't think you can, there's a way to, there's no way these kids are not going to be on the bus for 45 minutes. I mean, you think of, and we'll just take a third grader, some third grade, he's from, from uh, Cortland Estates coming down to BV, that's 45 minutes. I mean, and there's no, and especially when you consider, you know, pick up, drop off, pick up, drop through, you know, throughout the, the, the trip, there's just no way that that bus ride is not going to be 45 minutes. And, you know, or even, you know, uh, it, that's a long time for a kid to be on a bus. And there's also the cost of, you know, people to put on that bus because mark my words, you get a kid on a bus for 45 minutes, you're going to need some, you know, additional supervision besides just that bus driver. Just because kids, you know, 45 minutes on a bus, they're going to get itchy and, you know, they're, they're, you know, whether it's morning, whether it's afternoon, there's going to be behavior issues. Um, I just, I, I see that as being, you know, problematic. Um, and, and I do, I, I think it's important to highlight that that is, that is an issue for, for, you know, the kids. I mean, um, you know, and I, I appreciate it's the next page and everything that it goes on to with the multiple drop-offs and start times, but those two, you know, together, you know, it's a, it's a huge increase, you know, a huge problem for, you know, any parent who's, you know, you know, whether one kid's homesick or, you know, and, and mom has to, or dad has to, you know, drop somebody else to school or, you know, the bus or whatever. I just think that's a, um, I think that's a significant issue to, you know, in putting the kids on the bus for that much more time. And, and I do, again, and I understand the logic, but I do think that is um, something that um, is, you know, that undermines this, you know, this, this option or, or, you know, is a, you know, a negative in, in the, uh, you know, as we address this. Um, and again, between the, there is cost, whether it's, whether we get it back, whether it's out of our pocket or whether it's out of the state pocket, there's additional cost, um, you know, time and money. Um, and, and again, putting these kids on the bus, if it's 45 minutes each way, that's an hour and a half a day. That's a lot of time for a little kid to be on a bus. 
Um, and, and I see that as a you know, significant issue. Thank you, Mary Pat. Does anybody else have any comments before we move on to the next point that Mary Pat gave us a preview on already? Yeah, do we just have um, some average numbers of, you know, how much it would increase for students overall? Because, you know, it's, it's for two years, right? They'll be in each building for two years. So it's not like they're taking that 45 minute ride for five years, they're taking it for two oh. years and then they might be at a school that's much closer to them. That will be much well, shorter. Think of the kids, for, think of the so kids I'm just asking, hey Pat, let me, let me just finish. Has anyone done an analysis of what the average increase in time on a bus would be for children overall? So Corey, I can weigh in. Uh, Liz, oh, we had uh, that, yeah. Liz participated in a few, um, a, a few Q and A's with committee members um, two weeks ago, and uh, a couple pieces of information we need first. First would be uh, what grade levels would be assigned to which school and for which reason, and that every year bus stops and bus runs typically change because we have new kindergartners coming in, we have fifth graders leaving the elementary transportation system, and oftentimes we hear uh, when bus stops change or bus routes change or bus drivers change. Um, you know, kid, kids have had a certain route for a number of years and a certain uh, time that they get picked up or dropped off. And that changes based on real time data. We have a very complex software system that routes our buses. Um, we can override that routing, but the, the, the routing takes two things in mind. Try to have the minimal time on the bus because the, the longer that bus is on the road, um, we can't recycle that bus for the next tier of runs, right? So the, the transportation um, software system is aimed to have kids on the buses as, as less time as possible. Now, Liz can override that. and She uses small buses or vans to go in the different parts of our school district where buses can't go in and turn around. Um, the analysis that, that she gave the group is going either way from, from extreme to extreme right now in terms of uh, if you lived in, in Furnace Woods over by Hemlock Hill Farm, over you know, in the Yorktown um, Lakeland corner of our district, your bus ride today um, over to the high school, if you're a high schooler, um, averages between 30 and 40 minutes. If you live in the extreme part of, uh, of um, BV, um, sort of in the, up by the river on the Croton corner, and you're taking a bus to the middle school, your average ride time is 30 to 40 minutes, meaning the, the shortest ride is 30, the longest is 40. Now there'll be some fluctuation in there again, based on which child needs to go to which school um, during that year. But that's a pretty solid um, analysis because those are real kids today going to opposite sides. Now, depending on where kids live, what grade they're in and which school they're going to, the transportation software may route them differently. You know, you can get to, and, and I know this because I drive by your house on my way to work, there are times I can get to work quicker by going um, through Peekskill and, and coming, uh, coming in that way than driving all the way around uh, Watch Hill Road. And uh, the transportation software takes that into account based on literally where the kids live and where they need to go. So the, the rule of thumb that Liz gave us, and, and she has been working with um, one of our uh, transportation consultants, a gentleman we work with regularly to help us tighten a belt and you know find new revenue, um, said that that's a pretty good um, that's a pretty good marker. But you know, a couple big decisions need to be made to to finalize that and run um, bus runs for what the potential allocation of schools would be. Was we would need to determine which kids are in which school, and it all depends on where they live in the neighborhood and what school they're going to. But the 30 to 40 minute is, is today. Kids that go from one end of the district to the other is 30 to 40 minutes. So we haven't, we haven't done a mock-up making some assumptions that, you know, all things being equal today, if we made this school these two grades, this school these two grades, and this school these three grades, let's say, this is, this is the average bus ride. And we can't, we can't say that for sure then whether they're, rides would increase or decrease over time. Is that, is that correct? Correct. No, we not, have not done that mock-up. Not that mock-up. She feels comfortable with, with um, 
with the numbers I just gave you, because those are the most extreme, right? So if I'm a furnace, if I live in Furnace Woods or BV, and I'm going to Frank G, depending on the route and the number of kids, certainly it probably wouldn't be 30 to 40 minutes, it would be a little bit less. But that all depends on um, which children, you know, require a bus and, and what the school allocations are. Yeah, but not every kid's doing 30. My, my point is, you know, for the kids who do 30 to 40 minutes, it's less densely populated in those areas. So we might have fewer kids who are on that route versus now if we're taking the densely populated areas, it would be good to understand how many, how much more average time, like when you do a traffic analysis, you figure, okay, if I'm going to fix this road, what's the average commute time for a person? Uh, and how much will that increase or decrease based on the construction that I do? And then is it worth it, right? So it's kind of the same thing. If we haven't mocked this up, it's hard to make a comment as to whether or not it's going to make everybody. It could. It could be that everybody's got shorter rides on average. We don't know because we haven't done the mock-up, right? <laughs> or are we just saying in general we know it's going to be longer? We're we're, we're, you, not, we're right? you, yeah we're using today's today's kids and neighborhoods they live in and going over you know basically crossing the district to going to schools close to the high school BV and again depending on which way you go and certainly your today's commute to the middle school is basically identical to to Furnace Woods so what would happen is the next the next step in this process if we choose to move forward now or in a year from now or five years um, is an analysis on saying okay what what students should be in which school and why and then Liz will be able to run some um, transportation studies we purposefully didn't get that far um, because what grade levels are in which school shouldn't influence participation and feedback looking at the Princeton plan at the 30,000 foot level. Same reason we, we haven't, uh, we've begun the conversation with the three elementary principals, um, but are not in a position to assign them to certain schools yet, um, because those are, those are decisions that shouldn't influence um, the, the, the process of whether or not the Princeton plan has merit. Well, we're saying this is this is a significant enough threat, though, that it raised to sure. the level of being on this slide. So I would think that it has to be a significant consideration for us um, because it sounds like the time on the bus for kids is more important than the cost. The cost doesn't seem to matter because we're actually going to end up making money if that's the case. So, you know, if Enrique, your theory is right that we're gonna have more kids who go beyond 1.5 miles, then in theory, all the average bus times are gonna be a lot longer. Yes, yes I, I'm sure. One goes okay. with the other one, and, this, and that's what the study said. Obviously, you know, if you, if you are within half a mile from the school, that's the, that's the reason why we don't get state aid because the state is saying, that kid can walk. There's no reason for me to, to give aid to that district if the kid is so close to the, to, to the school. Right. And remember, we are a suburban district. Just imagine if you go you know, up in, in upstate New York, you know, it, it, they have one school and you know, just going to Arlington, Arlington, it, it, it is the size of uh, that district is all, I don't know how big it is, but it's at least five to six times bigger than us in area. And that's where the aid comes. The aid comes based on the, 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 the size of the area because upstate New York, that's what it is. You know, you have a, a one, one district for the size of miles and miles. We are suburban. Yeah. So, so to reconcile the two points, if Enrique, you're saying that we're going to get 150,000 more in aid, then by default, that would mean that kids' bus rides have to be longer on average. Yes. No question about it. Okay. Uh, that, that's what I'm trying to get to because we're, I'm yes. hearing mixed messages on this. There's no cost but impact because we end up making money on it. But the kids, you know, the, the evaluation is more about the subjective issue and the impact to kids on the longer bus rides. 
And now, yeah, but Corey, you know, like, like Joe said, this is looking at that 30,000 feet. But if the, the board decides, well, we just made $150,000 more, we can so add one boss it. and one driver, then maybe will be the same. We will have to make so, a study like that, but that's we're not, not going to make that mind. money. But we're not going to make that money. We're going to use that money to pay for the that's additional gas and the additional that, that no, 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 no. Good. So it'll be a wash. It'll be a wash. It sort mm -hmm. of pays for itself in that regard. But that being said, every child two th two thirds of his bus rides are going to be are going to be longer, no I'm matter where he lives. No question about it. I, right. I that's what we were saying. I don't think anybody. But that's my argue. point. It's like, and again, if you but you figure, you know, you talked about extremes. It's like any kid, though, you know, wherever wherever he he or she lives, it's like that kid is going to wind up spending significantly more time. And again, this the state aid is also not going to cover the cost of per, you know potential for monitors or you know, and, and for monitors on those buses or or the the wear and tear on on just. You know, the, the bus drivers, I don't know how it's... No, again, the monitors, they seen... will. If we decide to put monitors, that will be part of our transportation cost, and we will be aided on that. Well, I appreciate... Yeah, okay, that's good. But the, the flip side of that, too. But again, you just... I just... It's putting kids on the buses for that long. And, and I look at... I... And I'm looking down the road. I'm looking at behavior issues. I'm looking at... You know the 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 stuff that comes with that, and the um and and just the you know the, just that and and again is the 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 driving around and and the and maybe I'm looking at worst case scenarios, but you get a kid, any the kid is going from BV to Furnace Woods and from from um even even from Cortland Estates down to Frank G. Lindsay. That's a significantly longer ride for those kids. And especially no matter what age group you put in there, there's going to be problems with that. And, and again, if you have kids that, you know, you know, the second graders at Furnace Woods and the fourth graders at the, at, uh, at BV, that's a problem or, or Frankie or wherever, but it had two different schools that becomes a problem for everybody, especially, you know, the other pieces, the mother connection piece. And, you know, again, it's, I just, you know, it's. I, I think it's more than just the money. So I have I some like, reservations. I feel but. like we're talking about two different things. We're talking about maximal bus ride time, and we're talking about average bus ride time. Now, you might be, if you, if you, right, Corey? So if you do the average, you that's might right. be averaging a bus ride going from five minutes to 10 minutes, but that's going to be an overall increase in average. And I think what I'm getting is that the community is really worried about maximal bus time. You're not worried about like a minimal increase in, in bus time. So not, a, not a necessarily an overall average, but what is our maximal, you know, our, our maximal bus time going to be for these yeah. younger kids? Well, the maximal bus time is, is probably, you know, it's not much different than, than a lot of our kids experience. Some of our kids experience now, not as many. At the middle school level, not at the elementary. At school. the middle school and the high school level, right. So it would be, it would, it would start them earlier on, on some of that, but there will be points in their careers where their, their school careers where they'll be closer to a school than they might've been. So it's not that you're not going to be, you know, let's say you're in BV, you know, you're going to be at the BV school at some point during all that. So the average bus ride over time sounds like it's going to increase, but you know, it's not going to increase. That's why we're talking about average. Um, I don't think the maximal matters as, as much, to be honest. I think it's the mean because that takes into account minimum and maximum and average. I mean, unless we can find a median, which I doubt we're going to do here. Um, but I just think of what Enrique is saying. If, it, if we're going to get 150000 more in aid because of people living further from where they're going to school, by default, everybody's going to be taking longer bus rides. And I think that's what I'm trying to get at. Okay. Forget that 150 is still going to help pay the increased cost of fuel, the wear and tear on the buses, et cetera. 
So like Mary Pat said before, that would be a wash. We, we talked about that last week, last meeting, yeah. and, and there was virtually no impact on the buses. Right, we were talking about $15,000 in fuel and no impact on the wear and tear. So if I may be so bold to jump in here, I think there's clearly some more information that needs to be gathered about the transportation. Um, I, I think Joe just said a little while ago that he will um, start putting more pieces together. And one of the strategies that um, has been used is not to identify where the schools are and, and, and not, you know, so that would make it hard to do a simulated run, this is, you know, for, for the different grade levels. So potentially in the future, if you want to get more information from Joe, you can charge him to do that give you better better statistics, right? And allow him to come back to the board so it'll help you as you look to make this decision moving forward. But I think we're not gonna solve this tonight, um, but clearly you need more information to make a better decision. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Shall we move on? Yep. Okay, so next slide, please. So again, take an opportunity to look through this. So the first one speaks to some of the issues that Mary Pat has already brought up, but again, having the potential for parents to have multiple drop-offs, school start time changes, and quite honestly, if you had five kids at all the different levels, that would be a major, major issue, um, but clearly um, that is a concern that has risen to this level. Now again, the next one I want to emphasize potential. I don't want to say it's going to happen, but there is a concern that there'll be some concern. Uh, there's concern about the way people are going to react to these changes and um, putting students in uh, the same buildings could cause some issues between students and families. And really at the end of the day, it, it's more about trying to come up with the sauce and make sure that that doesn't happen. So that's where you see the, the part in the bottom talking about some training and celebrating, respecting the differences and appreciation of the district's diversity. But there is a concern that when you have kids getting together um, that typically weren't in the past, there could be some issues that are brought up. Uh, again, not just with the students, but also potentially with families. Questions, sure. comments? Seems like 2729 is almost mirroring one of the opportunities where kids uh, that we saw before where kids get to know each other earlier and have a bit mm -hmm. greater appreciation of the diversity in our um, community as often as the case, the, they're opposite sides to the same coin. Mm -hmm. So again, look at this through the lens of, okay, if this is a potential, we just have to keep our eye out on it. And then what could we do in our action plan development that could be either watching for this to happen or put some things in place to make sure it doesn't happen. I know the parents had some discussions with other schools about um, having different kids at different grade levels when there's Princeton plan. Were they able to talk to other parents and other districts about how they manage that and, and how their school districts manage that? Maybe we could get some information on that for our next meeting. Sure, we can talk to Joe about that. Get that done. Yeah, those, those were discussions that our folks had with, with the representatives from the other schools. And I know that, um, uh, you know, should we pursue this, those discussions and <clears throat> would, would continue as we identify best practice strategies to, to uh, mitigate that threat. And, and honestly, Carol, one of the challenges with those discussions were that the people who were at the table weren't necessarily there when the plans were implemented early on. So they really couldn't speak to the initial year or two of when it happened and what they had to go through, but they definitely spoke about that whole one community piece. And, and obviously they have to have certain things in place as you would in any school, if there's any issues to come up to have people help mediate the uh, situation. But um, most of the people that we spoke to, if not all, were not there during the transition from the neighborhood schools to the uh, Princeton plan. And the I was talking more to. about the first one with the multiple drop-off times and start times. Oh, those oh, okay. The logistics of that. I'm sure that there are parents in those districts that have three kids in three different buildings or whatever, and maybe they yeah. could lend some insight into how that was handled. They definitely spoke about that multiple times. And, um, you know, one of the things that we heard over and over again is we just worked it out. We just learned to work it out. We worked either with our neighbors to help us out um, you know, the, the district had put some things in place. If there was an emergency closing, 
that there was communication similar to I'm sure things that you do and when they developed the school start times and, and uh, ending times, they took into consideration this particular issue. Um, but I think the way, it, the way it was described to us is, hey, we just learned to work it out. And there's sometimes when there is potential for difficulties because of parents in New York City and can't get up there in time. And I'm, I'm sure the same is true in Hendrick Hudson that the, the, the parent calls the district and they make sure that the child is okay until someone gets to pick them up. But um, uh, for that particular one, yes, there was a lot of discussion around that. Any other questions or comments about these two points? All right, let's move on. Okay, to next, the next slide. So, Corey, this is the one I think I was talking about earlier on that you'll get a more sense of the concern that people had about losing the six years of meeting with the students and the sense of community each of the elementary schools. So if you lead through this, there's a number of things on this slide that speak to that. Yeah, yeah, okay, this, this makes more sense, thank you. Yeah, I think it's the sense of community I was thinking about in neighborhood was not just the students themselves, but it also includes the parents. And yeah, I think that, this that comment focuses more on the students. And I think when we yeah. talk about neighborhood, we talk about everybody in the neighborhood. It's mm -hmm. not just the students. Parents meet each other through the PTAs and through, you know, their, their local groups and they can meet each other easily because they're all in proximity to each other. Mm -hmm. Like that to me is a sense of neighborhood that would be lost uh, going to the Princeton plan. Yeah, that was definitely brought up. Uh, ironically, I think it was more brought up in that families would be making different friends from outside the neighborhood, um, which is also increasing potentially your, your pool of friends that you have, right? But clearly in this model, um, you know, everybody's in the neighborhood, they're all bringing their kids to school at the same time. It lends itself to, you know, with the current model, it lends itself to, you know, those families becoming closer. And I think um, when they were talking about the Princeton plan, they would still have their friends from the neighborhood, but they would also make friends from other neighborhoods throughout the district. So would it be Family. fair to say that that's both a threat and an opportunity that should be specifically called out? I, I think it was called out during our initial conversations. There was a convers you know, there was people who thought that way, but it didn't rise to the level of the priorities on here as far as the, an opportunity, I don't believe. I, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm surprised that I would, you know, if people are saying, well, you know, I don't want to lose my neighborhood. I don't want to lose my community. At the same time, you have an opportunity to meet people outside your immediate cohort group, right? You would think that one would go hand in hand with the other and would rise to the same level. Right, we're all sailors. We're one big henhood community. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Lisa, did you wanna say something? I did, I was just wondering, the, the growth model there that's in uh, quotation marks, what exactly is that? That's something- well, again, I think. Margaret may be able to um, do a better job after I'm done, but from um, what I understand is, oh, Margaret, you want to jump on it? Um, I, I don't know, John, you can add to this because it may be that I just was never in this conversation personally and all of the rotations and the breakouts, but yep. in education, so I, mm -hmm. um, the growth model for students is always talking about the possibility of improving, that a kid can always get better at something you're not born smart, you're not born, not smart, that you have the ability to get smart. So one of the things we always say to each other um, and we teach kids to say to each other is, I don't know the answer to that yet. So I, I don't know, I'm not sure what the group who coined the phrase in this particular response is referring to because educationally, the definition of the growth model is what I just said. I'm not sure if, I think they were thinking that a kid is in a building for six years and maybe they're thinking about the maturation and academic progress over six years. Um, John, did I, 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 I was never with the people or the group yep. that came up with this response. So I apologize. No, don't apologize. In fact, you're, you're almost spot on. I think what they're saying here on both the declassification rate and the growth model is if the students are in the building for six years, um, I think one of the phrases that was used where everybody knows your name, you know, kind of like the cheers uh, thing, um, that the, the teachers, the administrators, everybody's working with this kid for a period of time. 
and can work together to make sure that the child matures and grows academically um, to a level that's the, to, the, to their greatest level during those six years, right? So I think that's what it was that you'd be missing that because they would be going to an, another school after two years and there's really no continuity of the same people and people really understanding what that kid needs to be successful. So I think that's, that's really where they were coming from. Anybody else have comments about this slide? Allie. Um, to the point where disruption, most children see school, schools as a stable environment. Students may lose their sense of comfort and lack stability, which could lead to poor academic performance. I've heard this a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm surprised it fell this low on the threats because um, um, I, I just thought it would have been higher. In the next week or I would like to hear more maybe from our school psychologist or an independent psychologist. Is this a perceived threat or is this a real threat? Um, I think parents are worried about it. Uh, I would want to know if, if there's data behind it that shows one way or the other, if it's a real threat. This were a real threat. I'm surprised that there are so many school districts that do the Princeton plan, unless I'm misunderstanding it. I don't think there's so many schools that do the Princeton plan. No. I don't believe there's a lot of districts that do it. Allie, there is a reference to this in uh, one of the studies that we posted on our website. I think it was from the Attleboro School District, perhaps. Um, and they didn't do the research, but they did a meta-analysis of the research. So I think you can find some, <clears throat> find some information um, on that report with regards to the transitions. What I will say is because I was part of, of all seven meetings with um, our committee members and um, uh, parents from the other districts, what, what the parents from the three other districts said um, basically was a cautionary tale to not, not get so nervous about the transitions that the ki kids are resilient, they figure it out, they do well, and to not let that sidetrack your efforts going forward. And that was one of the 10 questions I mentioned earlier that our groups asked the uh, representatives in those seven meetings from um, Somers, your, or Somers, uh, Ossining, and, and Terrytown, and, and that was consistent feedback uh, across the seven meetings from those three schools. But um, you know, it's it's nerve wracking. Um, so it's certainly um, certainly a, a threat. And you know, should we choose to go forward, that would be part of the plan uh, of trying to mitigate the threat. Any other questions about this slide? We have one more slide with the threats, if we can go to that slide. And if you notice, there's double asterisks in front of this one. So um, if you went back to the, the slide, but had the breakdowns from the different groups, one of the groups had 63 listed as their top reason. So the thought here was, you know, as you go to read this, is that um, some of the groups would have changed some of their priorities and would have listed this higher if it was a definitive that the district was going to move in this direction in, in the fall of 2021. So had we come into this exercise saying um, the district, you know, that that first goal, the district is looking to move to the Princeton a restructuring to move to the Princeton plan in the fall of 2021. Um, my understanding was from the group that this would rise to the level of uh, the top of this the, the major threats and potentially even change some of their other things that they would be concerned about um, as they were listing out their their top five choices. So. Um, that's why the double asterisk is there. I just promised the group that I would share that information with you. So again, this is about the timing and some of the things that they feel are it could be potentially impacted if we try to do this in the fall of 2021. Thank you. Questions, comments? All right. I think Lori raised her hand. I can only see Lori. She's one of my four. I can yes. see. So. <laughs> um, you know what? The big one is 67. And this is what Corey was talking about before with Enrique to do a side by side, because originally when we heard, um, originally we talked about 14% increases and now we found out that they're going to be between four and six, if I am correct. And to actually have that comparison of what our taxes are actually gonna be with 
going with the Princeton plan, not going with the Princeton plan? Is it really going to be that much? I know for some people, any amount is too much. I, I understand that. But actually to see the numbers, and I know Joe said that he's going to take care of that. So I really think that those are important numbers to see, especially um, maybe over the next nine years since our cessation is for seven years, right? Is that correct? I think that's really important for people to to actually see, to see that comparison. Yeah, thank you for highlighting that, Lori. Right, because we also came from a time before Cuomo did our 2% thing where we actually had five and 6% increases. And uh, not too many people blink their eye. And I, I think that's too high to tell you the truth. <laughs> but um, let's just see what that money is because I know my taxes are very, very high. <laughs> Well, so I would, I would appreciate that comparison. Oh, Enrique, I don't even know if you were in on that conversation to tell you the truth. Can you do that, bud? Not now because I'm at home and I don't have- No, I don't mean right this day. <laughs> no, 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 not, not for tonight. Oh yeah, that's service. <laughs> All right. Right now, Enrique, but, let's uh, go, bud. Again, there's a couple of things that I need to mention because when, when the board makes a decision, it's important to know what happened last year. Last year, our increase was 5.9%. I got at least 30 calls saying, why are my taxes this high? One was from me. Exactly. And out of those 30, I would say at least there were five that said, I didn't understand if I had knew, I would have voted no. So I just want to, 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 to be very careful that people don't pay attention until they pay attention. And the problem is that it's not that the difference between Princeton, the Princeton and Living it as it is, is two and a half percent per year over the next five years. Just to say numbers, and that's I want to be to make it clear that I'm just giving numbers without having it, and that's not the numbers that will be at the end. But just for the sake of it, two and a half percent. It's not like it's only going to be two and a half percent. It's going to be five percent or seven and a half percent. So we're not talking, well, let's be one or three and a half. We're talking big numbers, even with the Princeton plan. We're, not, we're talking numbers of four to four and a half to close to 5% with the Princeton plan. That means that with the other one, with we staying as it is, we're talking about numbers between six and 7%. And I just want to, I don't want to scare the board or the community, but if any of those seven years, we have to go into contingent, we will have to cut about $3 million out of our budget. And to cut $3 million, is to cut between 30 and 35 teachers out of 255. That's how decimated the district will be. I, well, I, 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 I think what Lori is asking for is just the incremental difference. I mean, understand the 5% is almost, you know, four or five is, is the increase. He wants to know what the difference is if we, the, you know, between the five and seven or between the four and six, you know, what that would be on a dollar, you know, for like your average house or, you know, it, your, again, if, if we wind up with the Princeton plan, what, what that dollar difference will be on each household if we have one versus the other. I think that's what Lori was asking. Right. Um, Enrique, someone had mentioned before that you were trying to come up with some kind of like tax calculator, like we have a mortgage calculator. Yeah. I, Is that, that I would be very that. helpful too, I'll, so people I'll, can. Again, unfortunately I'm not at work, so I cannot bring it up. I could do it, 
Yeah, no, not for tonight. Not for tonight. We'll discuss this later. It's okay. Joe, uh, Joe and Enrique will discuss this and we'll, yeah, we'll get it together for next time. Yes. But I think that would be very, very beneficial if we put it on the website so people could type in what they're getting. And I, I don't know. I just think people seeing that number, like Corey had mentioned before, I think is a really good visual for them. Yeah. And we can do it this week. So anyone that is interested uh, can go to the website and look at his uh, uh, tax bill, see what's their tax assessment in, put it there and they'll know the amount. Yeah. Can, I, can I just add one, one question, Enrique? You know, you made a comment about going to contingency in Princeton plan. How is that different from our risk profile right now? Wouldn't that be the same situation if we had to go into contingency now, we would still have to do the same kinds of cuts? No, 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 Corey, because okay. again, the difference is contingency is based on the <clears throat> budget. So if my budget under consistency, under stat status quo is $2 million this year, more than my budget on the, uh, under Princeton, then, then those $2 million, I have to reduce them against contingency that they are not there in the Princeton. So if, if you remember last, last board meeting, I said that our increase, if we do Princeton is $700,000, if it's a uh, status quo, it's about two and a half million dollars. So if, if, we go to Princeton and we're in contingent. I only need to cut seven hundred thousand for the first year. But if yeah, we, well, in the we're second year, second year of Princeton only plan, contingent this, is only for a year. Right. So the second year, of, so if we went in contingent the second year of Princeton plan. Then it's the same risk profile that we have right now. Oh uh, yes, but with much lower numbers to have to cut because that $2 million, I will not have to cut it. So it would be a percentage of that 2 million that you wouldn't have to cut. Exactly. So it might be an extra 200,000, let's say that you wouldn't have to cut. A, a, a lot less, I'll say, instead of having to cut the 3 million that I mentioned, maybe we only have to cut one. But yes, when there's contingent, you always have to cut compared to the last year. Okay, all right, thank you. Greg, I think the last slide is just more questions and comments, but I, I, I would like to my, end my portion here just again to thank that stakeholder committee because they really did some great work and um, again, uh, they're just superstars and they just really, uh, it was enjoyable working with them and I hope to continue to work with them in the future, but um, really a great group. So thank you very much to them. Yes, thank you. You can tell from the comments and the, the the uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that they came up with, that they really dove deeply into this subject mm -hmm. and really took it seriously. So again, thank you very much for your time and effort on the committee. It's mm -hmm. going to really help us tremendously in making this decision. Um, anybody have any last minute comments or questions before we move on to our audience comments section? If at all possible, I'm going to say it again, and you could say the same response. I still think that we should do a community survey. It doesn't cost anything. You send it out, they answer it. It's one response per email. I just think, you know, when if people aren't paying attention after all this, because we hear a lot of stuff that people don't know what's going on, but I think the communication has been overwhelming to tell you the truth. So people need to, start, people need to pay attention, but I think a community survey would still be a very good idea. That's it. The and communication, just to highlight, Lori, the communication, though, has only come from, from people within the school district. It has not come from people outside. I've not received anything, you know, besides, you know, as a parent whose child has left the district, I haven't gotten any notification about this. I think the key is there's, there needs to be the inclusion of information and input from the people who have either left the district or are coming in who, who don't have children in Look the district me, yeah. to get a complete point, picture. So. Thank you, Bill. 
Uh, how much of this is going to be put on the website? Like I know there was, um, John had referred to the detailed uh, strengths and weaknesses um, that support the presentation. Is the presentation and the detailed um, details going to be put on the website or is it just the presentation is going to be on the website? Yeah, Bill, the, the presentation's on the website now as it's part of Board Docs, but what we'll do is we'll archive it on our um, cost analysis slash Princeton plan webpage. And we'll also include the detail that John mentioned in terms of um, all of the feedback from the stakeholder committee um, that led to the prioritization of what you heard tonight. Okay, so I know the board has given heavy consideration to a lot of those comments that are on there. I think uh, the board was not surprised by many of those. Um, it's things we had thought about already, but I think the people who are new to this, some of these comments are gonna be quite valuable. So you know, it's good for them to be able to see the, the detail beyond what we talked about tonight.